Ready, Judy? Oh. Order. I call this meeting to order. This is the Standing Committee on Health. My name is Suzanne Lonis Croft. I am the member for Lunenburg and acting chair. I'd like to um, note that uh, we have a substitution today, and um, Ms. Chender will substitute for um, Ms. Martin for the NDP caucus. Today, we will hear from the Pharmacy Association of Nova Scotia regarding pharmacists' role in healthcare and the scope of practice. I'd like to remind people to um, put their phones on vibrate or turn them off. And in case of emergency, please exit through the back door and walk down the hill to Hollis Street and gather in the courtyard of the Art Gallery of Nova Scotia. I will ask members to introduce themselves, beginning with Ms. Di Costanzo. Thank you. Chair, uh, Rafa Di Costanzo, MLA for Clayton Park West, and welcome. Hugh McKay, MLA for Chester St. Margaret's, and I'm substituting for uh, my colleague, MLA Keith Irving. I'm Benjamin Jessen, the MLA for Hammonds Plains, Lucasville. Hi, I'm Margaret Miller, the MLA for Hans East, and just wonderful to see you here. Uh, this is some good news. Thank you. Good afternoon, thanks for coming. My name is Colton LeBlanc, I'm the MLA for Argyle Barrington. Welcome, my name is Barbara Adams and I'm the MLA for Coal Harbour Eastern Passage. Hello, my name is Sue LeBlanc and I'm the MLA for Dartmouth North. Good afternoon, I'm Claudia Chender, the MLA for Dartmouth South. And we have our Ledge Council, Mr. Gordon Hebb and our committee clerk, Judy Kavanoff, and also assist support clerk, Sherry Mitchell with us today. Um, I will ask that our guests um, introduce themselves and um, do your opening remarks. Okay. I'm Alison Bodner. I'm the CEO with the Pharmacy Association of Nova Scotia. Good afternoon. My name is Curtis Chafe. I'm a pharmacist as uh, well as the chair of the Pharmacy Association for this year. Okay. Ms. Bodner. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to appear today to provide information on the role that pharmacists, pharmacy technicians, and pharmacies should play to help address the large and growing burden of healthcare in Nova Scotia. Everyone in this room understands that the residents of Nova Scotia are, on average, older and sicker than the rest of the Canadians, and that the cost of addressing healthcare needs of our residents under current models of care is unsustainable. With tens of thousands of Nova Scotians without any access to health care and thousands without timely access, growing rates of chronic disease and a lack of traditional primary care providers, our system is facing a crisis, a crisis that must be addressed now. If we're going to be successful in meeting the health care needs of Nova Scotians into the future, we must develop a new model of health care. The structure of our healthcare system in Nova Scotia and in Canada is over half a century old and very little has changed in that time. Can you imagine any other sector that's still operating today the way it did 60 years ago? Our provider-focused approach to healthcare is not working. If we want to reduce the burden of the healthcare system, then we must put patients first and design a system that not only treats the sick, but equally encourages individuals to stay well and keep those with minor or moderate disease as healthy as possible. In order to do this, we, might, we must utilize all healthcare providers, technology, and resources available in the most effective and efficient way. While my remarks will be focused on what pharmacy can do, I believe that utilization of all healthcare providers is critical and that the success of any new collaborative and multi-entry point system is the underlying infrastructure to ensure that patients and their providers have all of the resources at their disposal to ensure effective care and communications. Pharmacies and their teams have two key strengths that should be capitalized in a new model. Firstly, pharmacists are, without exception, experts in medication, and their scope of practice has evolved to reflect this. Secondly, pharmacies are accessible to everyone throughout Nova Scotia, 
often where other providers are not. Pharmacists are the medication experts. While some may still see the role as pharmacists filling a physician's order by counting the appropriate number of pills and putting a label on a bottle, this can't be further from the truth and the, uh, and the legal and ethical obligations on them. Every time a prescription is filled in Nova Scotia, pharmacists are required to ensure that the medication prescribed is appropriate for the patient, given their history, personal preferences, and other medications, prescribed or otherwise. If a pharmacist does not believe the prescription is appropriate, they cannot fill it, regardless of the prescriber's or patient's desire. This role is often misunderstood by patients, prescribers, and policy makers and is not utilized to the fullest extent in the system. Let's talk about drug shortages just for a moment. While we could discuss this alone for an entire session, I think we can all agree that drug shortages are becoming a larger and larger problem in our healthcare system. There are currently over 2,000 drugs on the National Drug Shortages Database, with approximately five new ones being added daily. This is a major problem for patients, but also for pharmacists and other prescribers. Pharmacists report having to deal with a shortage several times every day. Pharmacists have the legal authority to substitute a drug for another, and they are the most knowledgeable to do so, yet in most cases there is no compensation to take on this task. While we can discuss the causes and possible fixes to drug shortages, I think we can agree that it makes little sense to force a patient back to the original prescriber when a pharmacist can most effectively provide the service, and that pharmacists should be compensated for the work and effort expended to help patients navigate the issues and find appropriate solutions. Pharmacist medication expertise is also not being fully utilized in areas like opioid stewardship, antimicrobial resistance, and deprescribing. As the medication experts, and often the last point of contact with the patient before they commence any drug regimen, pharmacists are in a unique position to take on a much larger role in these areas. One role that we have suggested is in acute opioid prescribing. Pharmacists can be utilized to ensure that first opioid prescriptions are not filled in for more than the appropriate length, as determined by best medical practices, and to provide a follow-up pain assessment to determine what additional pain relief, if any, is required. Pharmacists could be utilized to help taper individuals off opioids in a safe and effective manner as well. Pharmacy can do a lot in this area, but to fully utilize pharmacy as a resource here, Health Canada would need to amend the Controlled Drug and Substances Act to include pharmacists as practitioners, which would allow them to adapt, reduce, or substitute controlled substances. I understand that Health Canada is open to this change if the provinces are interested in utilizing pharmacists in this manner. Our second advantage is accessibility. With over 300 pharmacies located throughout Nova Scotia, open for extended hours, pharmacists are the most accessible health providers in Nova Scotia. Residents in Nova Scotia visit a pharmacy on average 24 times per year. Imagine the opportunities to help patients with their health. Combining accessibility with our medication expertise and scope of practice, pharmacies can and should be utilized as another entry point to the healthcare system. Pharmacists have the legal authority to assess and prescribe for a variety of minor conditions, prescribe prescription renewals, provide immunizations, conduct point of care lab tests, uh, order lab tests related to the management of medication, and help patients manage chronic conditions such as diabetes and hypertension, two of the most prevalent and costly chronic diseases in Nova Scotia. With appropriate infrastructure in place, we envision pharmacy as a third tier in the system, managing minor or less urgent issues in managing chronic diseases while having the collaboration and referral mechanisms in place to refer to other providers as necessary. I'm thrilled to say that yesterday, December 9th, PANS and the government made a first and important step down this road. Yesterday, we signed an agreement that will, starting in 2020, allow Nova Scotia residents at no charge to them to obtain the following services at pharmacies throughout Nova Scotia. Patients who need to have a prescription renewed will be able to get up to a six-month renewal. Women who have uncomplicated urinary tract infections, one of the leading causes of ER visits in Canada, will be able to have them treated by their pharmacist. Individuals who suspect they have shingles will be able to have that assessed and medication prescribed by their pharmacist. And women looking for birth control will now be able to get it at their pharmacy. This is a terrific first step and one we were very proud of. 
We understand that the trust that has been put in the profession, and we know that pharmacists will live up to that trust, and in doing so, help to improve access to our healthcare system and improve health outcomes for Nova Scotian. There is so much more that pharmacy can do, and I would like to focus on just a couple of them, chronic disease and public health immunizations beyond flu. 2017 Canadian research on hypertension suggests that Nova Scotia could save up to $400 million, $490 million over 30 years if it invested in pharmacists to manage hypertension. Hypertension Canada agrees and recommends pharmacists be engaged to do this. Why has pharmacy been successful in hypertension management and other chronic diseases as well? It's simple, accessibility combined with medication expertise. Pharmacists have the opportunity to regularly connect with patients, and we know that change, particularly lifestyle and health change, requires regular check-in and support. Pharmacy teams are uniquely positioned to do this. We see this today in our anticoagulation management project as well. Patients love the convenience of getting their blood tested, reported on, and medications adjusted right there in the pharmacy. We can be successful in keeping these chronic disease patients healthy and out of acute care because we make it easy for them. I think that's an important lesson for all healthcare design. Finally, the last area I would like to speak to is the underutilization of pharmacy and public health immunization. Pharmacy has been successfully delivering flu immunizations for six years now, increasing our delivery from just over 80,000 shots in the first year to 150,000 last season. Pharmacists have the scope of practice to deliver all publicly funded immunizations and numerous other vaccines as well, yet as a system we have not capitalized on pharmacists' scope and pharmacies' accessibility to improve vaccination rates. Engaging pharmacists to provide immunizations like pneumococcal vaccine for seniors, tetanus, MMR, HPV, and an, in creating an expanded flu program for school-aged children and their families would help get Nova Scotia closer to achieving Canadian immunization targets. Once again, I thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today as it truly represents a turning point for pharmacy, patients, and the Nova Scotia primary health care system. Thank you, Ms. Bodner. Uh, we will now open up for questions um, and a reminder to wait for me to um, state your name so that the microphones may be turned on. We will start with the PC caucus for 20 minutes. Mr. LeBlanc. Thank you, Madam Chair. Again, thank you very much uh, for your presence here this afternoon. It's uh, Great to continue the discussion on healthcare, which uh, obviously affects uh, so many in, across this province. And it's uh, great to hear, um, Madam Bodner, you call it what it is. It's we're in a crisis. And for the past uh, six years, the government has had time to uh, take action to improve access to uh, primary care. And I'm, I don't know if I should be uh, delighted but or surprised but uh, with the timing of this announcement but nonetheless um, I'm, uh, I'm optimistic that this is a, an announcement that will uh, positively out, uh, have a positive outcome on the uh, for patients across this province so um, you spoke about uh, infrastructure um, with proper infrastructure in place so what type of infrastructure uh, would you envision uh, be in place for uh, your for the pharmacists to uh, continue to expand their scope Ms. Bodner. Thank you. I think principally uh, we need to develop a communications infrastructure and a, a uh, patient file sharing mechanism. So I am well aware of the OPOR and its, in its future plans, but we're a long way off from that in, in community practice, whether that's physicians or, or, or pharmacists. So right now, uh, you know, we are in the antiquated world of every time a pharmacist does a, uh, a visit with a patient for a primary care service, we actually have to go right out of fax and we put it in the fax machine and we fax it to the doctors whose staff scan it into the file and, and then that's how it gets recorded. We need an integrated system. They need to know what we're doing. We need to know what they're doing. We need to have immediate access um, to, to lab. We need a, an efficient communication vehicle between, between the parties. Because um, right now it is, it is a bit frustrating and uh, you know, we, we had hoped, I guess maybe years ago, that the drug information system would act sort of as a tool, but it, because it resides as a separate system outside of an EMR, so outside of a physician's uh, electronic record, it requires another step. It requires them to leave their EMR, go to another system, search for whatever they might think might be in there, 
<laughs> uh, and search through the various tabs on the, the DIS and then go back into their system. That's inefficient for them. We can't ask them to be constantly looking through that. We need a system that we have a common record and, it's, and, and I think there are ways to do that. Um, but the more services we do, the more critical this becomes because they need to know. You know, if we've treated someone for a urinary tract infection, if they miss the facts, the yes are going to get a fax in 24 hours, within 24 hours. But if they miss that fax, um, you know that that creates an incomplete record. And so it's really important as we as we think about OPOR, we think about how providers can better collaborate in community. So I'm ta not talking about housing them all in a building. I'm talking about how we have community practitioners collaborate. We need to have a system that enables effective communication and file sharing. Mr. LeBlanc. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for that response. Um, I think the announcements that were made are certainly going to benefit those without a family practitioner, uh, those that are uh, inconvenienced by the wait times to see a family practitioner uh, or are obligated to go to a, an emergency room. So you, you spoke about documentation, uh, documentation or communication vehicle uh, for those with a family doctor, but how would you envision uh, such model for patients that don't have a family practitioner? Ms. Bodner? I think it's it's similar. So again, right now, when a patient doesn't have a family uh, physician, we provide that same documentation. We provide them a physical copy to take with them should they see any practitioner later. Again, inefficient. I'm a I'm a patient. I, I lose my stuff all the time. So I, I you know relying on patients to remember to bring that and keep that complete is not the right way. So again, this gets back to one patient, one record. And I really mean one patient run record. I don't mean where we all write to our own files and then we selectively choose what comes from our files into a record. <laughs> I mean, we write and it gets recorded into a single record so that all people within the care team, uh, whenever that may happen, get access to a complete record so that they can provide the most effective care. Mr. LeBlanc. Thank you very much. So when this program uh, is fully Im implemented after in the new year, um, what will the experience be like for coming into a pharmacy? If I walk into a pharmacy um, at my local grocery store, um, how am I going to be greeted? Is there, um, how are things going to be set in place? And basically, how has the government uh, supported your association to ensure that pharmacists have the adequate resources and infrastructure uh, to do so? Because there may be some in the province that do not have um, enough room, for example, for assessment rooms. Ms. Bonder. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, pr pharmacist prescribing has been in place since 2011, and so the, the College of Pharmacists since that time has had standards in place for appropriate uh, consultation and assessment rooms. So, by and large, um, and uh, there may be a couple of exceptions out there that I'm just not aware of, but by and large, every pharmacy has at least one now uh, uh, consultation room that meets all of the privacy standards. So, you know, it can't see through it, it's soundproof to the ceiling of the building, rega regardless of height, um, and, and all of the appropriate. And they've actually just instituted additional requirements for the purposes of m more types of assessment. So, ensuring again that we have um, all of the tools at hand in the assessment room. What I can tell you is many pharmacies who are looking down this path are looking to a second assessment room already and we have a number of pharmacies that have already constructed this. I, I envision as we move through this process and the volumes increase, there will be absolute demand and necessity to have additional um, additional assessment rooms. You know, I think we're at the early stages and I think that's why starting with a few and, and having it grow is the right approach to this. I think if you went and just said, here's your scope of practice, we're gonna fund you to do everything tomorrow, I think you would find that, oh, wow, we need three or four assessment rooms, nobody has them, how do we build up to that quickly? So what we're doing here is a step 
approach. Let's start, we'll build, we'll get patients. We're going to get feedback from patients on, on what they want the experience. Do they want it to look different? We're going to be doing some focus groups. Again, ensuring that patients are, most, are as comfortable um, so that they want to get these services uh, where they want. Because we don't just want patients who don't have a doctor and don't have timely access. Because in, in, in my opening remarks, I alluded to creating more access points, more entry points to the system. So if we, if we encourage, as a system, as a government, encourage patients with these type of conditions to go to their pharmacies, then there are spots available at the family physicians to take more urgent needs. And that's what we really want to do. We want to move the, the lesser urgent, the, the less complicated out to other providers, whether those be nurse practitioners, nurses, pharmacists, um, paramedics, we all have a role to play. And then we allow the physicians, the family physicians, to take on uh, the patients who really need to see them. Mr. LeBlanc. Thank you very much for that answer. Um, so the, and what I guess I'm concerned a bit is that, you know, everybody, like you said, you don't want everybody to go to the pharmacy. Um, I'm concerned that there might be an influx of people going there and then there might be some barriers, people being turned away. Um, but I'm hoping that won't happen. Um, the money figure that was announced yesterday, the $9 million, which is roughly $1.8 million per year, um, were you guys consulted in any such way uh, to f come up with that figure? Um, and if so, or if not, either way, um, what is ex what's expected um, from your association, let's say, if the funds are used up within the first six or nine months? Ms. Modner. So let's th be clear. That was just an estimate based on a... Uh, what I'll call our best guesses of, uh, of utilization based on other provinces uh, and other services and how they have ramped up over the years. So we have flu shot here as an example. I mentioned that we started at 80,000, we did 150,000. So that was a nice incremental growth year over year. And so we have that. In other provinces where they do renewals or they do UTIs or contraception, we do have some data on growth. So those are best guesses uh, on utilization over the course of the five-year agreement. So yes, I mean, this has been a negotiation uh, that's been in play now for quite some time. Our contract actually expired three months ago, almost three months ago. Uh, and so we've been working since the fall of 2018 on coming up with uh, a model that we could all live with. Um, you know, there, there, in addition to new services, there were some cuts on, on some other sides of things. So this was a give and take. Um, but the real goal here was to take that first step into primary care and, and see where that leads us. Mr. LeBlanc. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, with an expanding scope of practice comes training and, and, and continuing learning. Uh, Who's the, is it the college that oversees the continuing learning aspect or the new training of, of the scope, or is it the association? Ms. Bonner. <laughs> so when the College of Pharmacists, who is the regulator, um, when they implement an expanded scope of practice, they, they do so based on what pharmacists are already being trained to do and are already being educated to do. They, they don't add a new scope of practice that our, our pharmacists have not been trained for. So pharmacists in pharmacy school have been getting contraception education, UTI, that's been part of the curriculum for, you know, 10 plus years. Uh, and, and so those, those are ready to go. So there is no uh, mandatory education. There is no certification required. What we have is the general practice standard in this province which says, pharmacists, you must keep up to date and current with everything you do. And if you are not able to practice at that level, then you must make take whatever courses, take whatever training, do whatever you need to do to make yourself capable or don't practice in that area. And, and that's a standard that's re, uh, that is put on pharmacists for their entire scope of practice, whether that be dispensing in certain disease states or whether it's chronic disease management or, or giving an injection, they have this obligation on them. So again, there are no set standards. Some other provinces have done that. You cannot prescribe birth control unless you take course A, B, and C. Our college takes a different approach, takes a professional judgment approach that says, you're a professional, you have to make those decisions. We have created programs for all of this and said to those 
either A, you graduated before it was part of the curriculum, or B, it was part of your curriculum 20 years ago, and because it wasn't your scope, you haven't done it, <laughs> so you need some refreshing. So yes, we have programs available, and pharmacists are, are signing up to, to take those. Mr. LeBlanc. Thank you very much. I found a table that compares the scopes of practice of pharmacists across our country and seems that Alberta has green check marks along the way um, with, um, I guess, mostly what I've noticed here is had to do with Schedule 1 drugs in Nova Scotia. So what barriers uh, exist or what would you like to see, number one, what would you like to see um, within the scope of practice to continue to grow in Nova Scotia and what barriers exist for that to, to happen? Ms. Bonner. I think one of the key barriers right now is, that, is I mentioned to you a couple of things. So our scope of practice for dispensing alone requires us to ensure it is the right medication for that person at this time given everything. <laughs> and that everything includes labs, right? So if this patient is due for a, a, a blood test to monitor their condition and they don't have it, and they show up to either have it prescription dispensed or let's say they're out of the prescription and they need it renewed, we need a lab test. We have the legal authority in this province to order them. We do not have the operational authority. It hasn't been operationalized. So pharmacists can't actually order any lab tests. And so that causes a delay. It causes us to refer back, to send the patient back to their patient or to track down the physician and ask them to put an order in place for it. So again, it's an inefficiency that's becoming more and more critical to the work we do every day in dispensing, but it'll be important for, very important for renewal and it's incredibly important for chronic disease management because uh, those are the patients that you know you really need regular check-ins to make sure that what you're doing is, is working so the inability to order labs I say is, is one of the key issues and again the other is the whole documentation and information sharing and making sure other providers have the information at hand when and where they want it so I'll give you an example from labs so we are we can do point of care test labs so our INR project as an example great project patients love it it's efficient but we send those lab tests by fax to, to the physician. And so they rest in their sort of fax file for that patient. All other lab tests they receive come through the portal and, and are in their lab list. So our point of care tests don't end up in their lab list. So they really don't know. Um, it went on a quick glance. That, that we've done a test where, you know, if we've been working with them, they might know, right, I remember this patient's in that program, so I'm going to go look in my fax file and, and check the results there. But again, it's an inefficient process for sharing information. And so I think if we're truly going to create a collaborative uh, model here, we have to find better means of sharing information between providers. Mr. LeBlanc. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, I found a study or, or survey here, and it was 98.6% of the respondents have at least one of the five major risk factors that can lead to chronic disease in Canada, which goes hand in hand with managing chronic conditions and preventative health care. And I think that's part of uh, the evolving model of health care in our province is putting more emphasis on prevention and uh, how we can uh, slow down the overflow of, of um, uh, diseases and illnesses uh, in our system. So um, can you speak a little bit on the roles of pharmacists? I know you spoke about it a little bit, but uh, in the roles of managing chronic conditions and, and the screening and, and uh, managing of those, please. Ms. Bonner. For sure. So there's, there's some great research, and, and I'm happy to, to leave copies that you can distribute, or, or you can go on to our um, We Need Pharmacy page on our website, and all this research is there as well. Um, but. There has been very good research done in, in Canada uh, around uh, chronic disease management by pharmacists, and, and, I'll, and I'll point to the, the benefits of pharmacist care in hypertension specifically. Um, so the, the study that was done, I, I mentioned, um, it was a study done out of Alberta. Uh, it, was, it was a controlled study, and then it was evaluated by researchers out of uh, Memorial University in, in Newfoundland. Uh, to actually work out the economic impact of that. And, and so they, they did that, and they, and they came to the conclusions, uh, and this is for Nova Scotia alone, that if pharmacists were able to practice to their full scope, they could save $490 million over 30 years, but, but 
more importantly, <laughs> um, they could significantly re reduce adverse events, so cardiovascular events like stroke, angina, heart failure, uh, reducing these incidents by, you know, in the 17,000. So under usual care, they would estimate in that time period there would be 45,000 cases. Um, and under full scope care by pharmacists, there would be 28,000. So that's a huge reduction. Um, also kidney failure events. Um, and then in saved life years, so almost 30,000 saved life years in that 30 year period. Okay, so this, this is huge. This is why Hypertension Canada says we should have pharmacists do this. And again, it's because you're combining accessibility. Pharmac uh, patients are in pharmacies up to 24 times a year and the medication management. And, and that's, that's the key here to, to success. And you can see that in hypertension. We see it play out in diabetes. We did a pilot program um, last year. It was called the Collaborative Care Demonstration Project uh, in which uh, pharmacists and physicians worked together to identify patients who would benefit. These were multiple comorbidity patients, so they had to have at least two chronic diseases or a single chronic disease with multiple uh, contributing factors like obesity, smoking, um, and docu or documented non-adherence to their medication. So they, they worked together to identify this. Pharmacists worked with the patient to identify a care plan, um, and then they executed that plan over the following 12 months. And we saw statistically significant improvements in all of the clinical areas, including reduction in, in smoking, including weight loss and lifestyle goals as well, better eating. But on the clinical side, improvements uh, in, in all of the clinical outcomes as well. It's Again, it, it's about patients' convenience. It's about the trust they have in pharmacists every year. Pharmacists rank as one of the top trusted uh, professions in Canada year over year. Uh, and, and we're in a unique position, and I think that we need to capitalize on that role um, in, in being that health coach, for lack of a better word, with the expertise of medication to really help patients achieve their goals. Mr. LeBlanc, for a little under a minute. <laughs> thank you very much. So again, uh, thank you very much for your time uh, this afternoon, and I agree wholeheartedly. This is about patients, and I, I am thankful that uh, patients in Nova Scotia, whether they have a family doctor or they don't, are going to have increased access to, uh, f to care and hopefully it'll be in the right direction, especially when it comes to managing chronic conditions. Uh, this expanding scope uh, or, or availability to do uh, more in, uh, in their practice for pharmacists, is this going to create an opportunity to have more pharmacist uh, jobs in Nova Scotia? Ms. Bonner. We, we hope so. This has been a period of nine, up to, to, up to yesterday, a period of nine consecutive years with cuts to pharmacy. And not just little cuts. <laughs> <laughs> really significant financial cuts to Order. pharmacy. Time has lapsed for the PC caucus. We'll turn it over to the NDP caucus for 20 minutes. Ms. LeBlanc. Thank you. Um, I'm going to get to those cuts in just a second. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I just wanted to know, um, so um, in terms of the, of the announcement that was made yesterday, um, so can you just sort of, in a nutshell, clarify uh, what the province, uh, what the province um, used to fund pharmacists to do before and what is being funded now? And uh, if you could talk a little bit about what else you were looking for in the negotiations, and then it would be great if you could talk about what you just mentioned, uh, maybe not just now, but a few minutes ago, when you talked about the give and take and that there were cuts made. If you could sort of expand on all of, all of what went into the announcement yesterday. Ms. Bonner. Sure. So, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a long uh, process, and, and as with any negotiation, there's give and take. But to give you a picture of where we were before, so prior to yesterday, um, with the exception of flu shots and naloxone training, uh, which are province-wide, anything else pharmacy was funded to do was for pharma care beneficiaries only. So the 200,000 people in this province, either seniors or fi family pharma care, we weren't, we weren't able to provide services to anyone else. Um, so yesterday's announcement included a whole separate agreement. So we continue to have an agreement just for pharma care services, but we now have a separate agreement where any services that are province-wide will now reside. So they're not to pharma care, they are to the health 
system uh, in general. So that's that's a great step. It's something that we've actually wanted for 10 years. We've we've been we've been wanting a separate agreement outside of PharmaCare for 10 since I've been at the association for 10 years. So this is for us is is kind of. A, a massive first step in, in actually integrating into primary care and not just looking, being viewed as the distributors for medication. That being said, as the distributors for medication, <laughs> um, our funding model, um, with the exception of services, has been, is predicated on the price of drugs. So we receive a, a, f a fixed dispensing fee, but our, we have a markup uh, which is a function of the drug price. And since 2011, drug prices, to the benefit of everyone in this country, have been reduced. And they've been reduced significantly. They've been reduced from about, on average, uh, if you compare it to a brand drug to a generic drug, in 2011, when we started this, they were probably 57 cents on the dollar, a generic. They're now down in the low 20s. We have some as low as 15, some at the most common are at 15 or 18, and then they go up to 25, uh, and then new entries are significantly higher until there are three uh, manufacturers. But because of that funding model, uh, and it, that model's been in place for decades, when the price drops, so has the compensation to pharmacy. And so for, and for nine consecutive years, and that's outside of our contract, the price of drugs. We don't, that has nothing to do with our contract. It just happens to be our markup is a percentage of the MLP. And so as that's been reducing year after year, uh, at first independently by governments putting legislation in place, and then uh, when the uh, Pan-Canadian Pricing Alliance came into effect uh, about five years ago now, they started negotiating directly with uh, generic manufacturers, and they now have an agreement in place for the pricing of, of not just generic drugs, but uh, other, uh, other molecules as well. So that's been a huge hit to pharmacy. So I'm sure all of you have heard from pharmacy owners and pharmacists about cuts to services, cuts to hours, cut to jobs. Uh, and that's been, a steady, that's been a steady model over the last few years. Now that we have this type of investment into, into pharmacist services, it is my hope, it's my expectation that we've, we're at the bottom and we're on our way back up. And now we'll start investing in more hours, more overlap of pharmacists, more availability to do this. Because there's lots of pharmacists around to do it. We have the manpower to do it, and they're looking to get more hours or looking to, to, to do more. So I, I think this, this new model is that first step in some stable funding, because I think you are all as aware as I am that patients don't want to pay out of pocket. And so the models, although we've had most of this scope since 2011, it's really hard to base a business model and getting patients to pay for health care. And so that's been a real challenge over the last nine years. Ms. LeBlanc, did all your questions uh, there was three yeah. there, they all got answered? Um, sort of. Uh, I'm wondering if you get, the one thing that I didn't hear there was, uh, were there, did you get everything that you were looking for in this round of negotiations and what is still on the table for the next round? What would you be going after? Ms. Bonner. Of course we didn't get everything. We, we submitted a proposal where we said, and I think we took a very open approach. We took our whole scope of practice and said, this is why this would be of value to you. This is this service. So chronic disease management, this would be of service to you. We would like to do this. Opioid management, all minor ailments, you know, all that type of stuff. We, we, we laid our scope out and we said, what is of most value? What can we work on together? And what's a good first step? And this is where we landed. And we landed here with good reason. I mean, UTIs are, are the, the fifth most common reason for an ER visit. We have documentation that there, are, there is access issues to contraception. Young women, in particular, cannot access contraception in the way they want. Shingles is a time issue. If you have shingles, you need to start on medication very quickly. So there's very strategic reasons why we settled on these ones as a starting point. Where do I want to go and what's still on the table? Absolutely. We have uh, chronic disease management. We want to expand. We have a pilot program that's in its final stages of evaluation on the anticoagulation. We absolutely want that expanded. We have a pilot that's in smoking cessation right now and hopeful that the results will be what we think they will be and we want that funded. <laughs> there, we would like to see really fully integrated as another access point into healthcare, and uh, I, you know we're working towards that. Ms. LeBlanc. So when you were uh, talking about the lab test issue, the fax file and the in the electron file, which is like you know it's it's quite unbelievable. Um, 
Does that, so then the number, the, the number one thing that was announced yesterday, the patients who need to have prescription renewed will be able to get one with a six month renewal, or up to a six month renewal. Does the lab test issue that you were just talking about, like sometimes people want a, a renewal and they need to get blood work done first, is that going to affect that, um, that ability in Ms. particular? Bond. Ms. Bonner. It, it will, so it, absolutely, but there's a couple of things in place. So one, they may have had it and we simply don't have the record. So we do have access to share, so the, the health portal in where lab results reside if they've been ordered and if they were blood was taken by the public phlebotomist. If it was done in a private facility, those results do not reside in share. So it's not a complete record of their lab results. So number one, we can access share. Number two, um, if they have a physician, and there's a, it's a, we can make that call. But yes, if in fact you get to the point where you're like, wow, you haven't had your <laughs> you haven't had your test done in your like six months overdue, then yeah, it's going to be a, it's going to be an issue because we can't uh, order the lab test. What we can do is say, okay, well we're not comfortable giving you a six month supply, uh, but we will give you enough, say 30 days. We'll we'll do a renewal for 30 days. In that 30 days, you must go find a walk in or. Uh, and go get the lab tests, and then we can we can do it. But yeah, it's an unnecessary hurdle um, to to their care. Ms. LeBlanc. Thanks. So I just want to ask a little bit about point of care testing. Um, we know that new medical technologies have given us a number of point of care tests for a variety of ailments. Um, you know, they for a litany of different issues from syphilis to malaria to cardiac issues to HIV. I'm wondering, you did mention point of care tests for a certain one thing, but I'm wondering if there's any interest in the pharmacy community in providing that more of that kind of testing. Are pharmacists trained to administer those sorts of tests? And if not, again, is that part of uh, the training that is available? Ms. Bonder. So, so yeah, point of care technology has come, um, has made leaps and bounds uh, from where it was uh, previously. So I mentioned our anticoagulation management project. Um, that is a point of care test. It is in fact the same point of care test they use on the floor in the hospital. Uh, and, and it has very, very good results. So. Um, Again, from a convenience perspective, from reducing the burden on the lab uh, system, reducing wait times in lab, point of care testing is something that we need to seriously consider. Um, we, we uh, as part of our agreements with government, we have a $2 million um, uh, project fund. It's been in our agreement in the past and it continues in this agreement. And, and one of the things we're talking about for the next one is, is, is a diabetes management program. And one of the things we're, in again, in that we're recommending the utilization of point of care testing to make it easier for patients to manage their health. So there's a lot of things that we could do uh, in the pharmacy uh, with point of care tests, A1C, lipid panels, things like that right in the pharmacy. There would be some that would have to be ordered in a lab. And again, if we had our lab ordering authority, we could make it a complete and seamless package. But yeah, point of care technology, HIV is a great one. Um, you know, I've had some contact with, uh, with Capital Health, uh, NSHA, and about uh, potentially rolling uh, HIV testing out in a pharmacy as well. We haven't, uh, that hasn't continued um, in, in the past few months, but I'm hopeful like pharmacy is the place to do this type of stuff. It's, it's private, uh, it's inconspicuous <laughs> uh, when, you, when you go into to these. No one knows what you're going into to the pharmacy for. Um, so it's a great place to do that kind, whether it's the STI to, or HIV. I mean, there's all sorts of opportunities to utilize the point of care systems. Point of care testing um, is relatively simple in the sense of the activity of testing. <laughs> uh, most, we, ours, anything we do in pharmacy is a lancet. Uh, so it's a finger probe. We don't do a blood draw from a, uh, from a venous blood draw. So it's a lancet, which is patients do this themselves, right? So it's not, it's not a tricky technique. Uh, and once you understand the test, then it's a question of understanding how to read the results. And, that, and so we, we do provide training when we introduce uh, a, a new point of care. We also maintain a procedures manual at, uh, at PANS that we provide to pharmacies in different point of care devices that we envision that they might want to use. So I, I do see point of care testing as a huge part of our system in general uh, moving uh, moving forward. Ms. LeBlanc. And so what kind of funding commitment from the province would, would be required to provide, you know, for instance, a, like a rapid point of care test for HIV? 
Ms. Ms. Bonner. <laughs> Uh, you would have to cover two things. One's the cost of the test, and absolutely, point of care testing is more expensive per test than lab testing. But it's not often as is that much more than you think. I mean, it really isn't. Um, but it, but absolutely, it is more expensive than if you go make someone wait and, and get a blood draw at the farm, just because of the volumes uh, and the machines that they're using in the public labs. So there's that cost, and then you would have to compensate pharmacy for the just the administration of the test, plus whatever the disease management process is that you're doing. And, um, you know, and that would vary by the test and by the disease state. So it would be something you'd have to work out uh, each time. Ms. LeBlanc. Uh, another sort of interesting um, point of care testing is around Lyme disease. And I understand that that test isn't, um, or that, that research isn't totally uh, finished, but you know, we know that um, the faster an infection from a tick bite gets addressed, the, you know, the, the uh, better your outcomes for not getting Lyme disease or chronic Lyme disease are. Um, so it's still in development, but um, would it be possible for pharmacists to, pr pr in the meantime, to prescribe antibiotics for tick bites in the same way that they're now allowed to prescribe antibiotics for uh, UTIs or, you know, a simple, like, you know, very specific type of infection. Ms. Bonner. So at the moment, uh, that is not within uh, the scope of practice. Uh, we've had lots of discussions about it with our regulator, uh, who is open to the idea. Um, but there's still a lot of controversy right now over uh, Lyme disease, whether or not it is Lyme disease or, or whether we're over treating. Um, I had just I had a call just uh, in the last day or two from from somebody saying that some ask, something like 20% of visits now into to an ER. This is just a, this is a, a resident telling me this. So this, uh, that 20% of ER visits are now related to Lyme disease. I don't know if that's true or not true, but uh, it's certainly more prevalent. Than than it ever has been, but there's still some hesitancy um, by some groups within uh, you know, the medical community as to what in fact should be done for the majority of patients. I think once there is more or there's less debate in a clearer process that we certainly would be able to add that in um, to the scope of practice and it's something that pharmacists would be able to, to handle very easily. Yeah. Dr. Chafe, did you have something you wanted to add to that? Oh, you no. were... <laughs> no. Okay, thank I'm you. Not. Okay, <laughs> Ms. LeBlanc. How much time do I have? Um, you have um, six minutes. I just want to change uh, course again. Um, I have a few general questions about the state of drug compliance in Nova Scotia. You did mention um, it a little bit in your comments, but um, we know uh, that many people are not com aren't able to comply with the correct course of their medication because of the cost. Um, it's not just people who are living in real poverty who are facing this. There's lots of people that we've spoken to who have private uh, insurance. That insurance maxes out, and then they're left to have to pay for, for instance, their insulin and test strips out of their own pocket, and they're spending thousands of dollars a year to do that. And we know that pe people do things like, you know, ration their medication when, when money is tight. I have a number of constituents who have told me they do this uh, in, in the, who have come into my office. So I'm wondering if you can tell the committee from a clinical perspective, uh, what happens when a person is only able to take their medication, for instance, every other day? Uh, or what happens when they cut their dose in half or if they don't, for instance, test their blood sugar as much as they're supposed to? Ms. Bonner. If you don't mind, I'm going to let Dr. Chafe uh, answer the clinical <laughs> response to that. Thank you. Dr. Chafe. Uh, honestly, it's, it's what you would think. You know, if somebody's not on an appropriate dose, then which, whichever condition that that treatment is supposed to be treating is going to be substandard. So in the case of a diabetic, if they're having their insulin or they're cutting it back, sometimes, uh, you know, you, you may not be within that four to seven. And they go, eh, maybe it's okay to run in the nine to tens. I don't feel so bad. And you know, my insulin lasts a little longer. Same thing with, uh, you know, blood pressure medications. Now, some people are very good at monitoring their own blood pressure. Um, it's one of those silent conditions. You know, you don't understand, you don't know until you, you measure. Um, and if they run a little high, then they think it's not so bad. The unfortunate thing, though, is that when things don't go within established treatment protocols and, and, and 
we follow guidelines, um, what you're going to end up having in, in diabetics in particular, you're going to have more heart attacks, more strokes, you're going to have more infections and amputations, you're going to have more retinopathy and blindness, you're going to have all those associated conditions because they're, they're not controlled under their, their condition. Same thing with people with cardiac disease, if, if they're not taking enough cardiac pills or they're, or they're letting their blood pressure run high or uh, they're not taking control of their cholesterol. Well, those are all risk factors. Um, it's not the blood pressure that gets you, it's, it's the heart attacks and the strokes. And so what you end up seeing is that those people are not going to live as long and they're actually going to have a lot more morbidity because they are going to have those, those hard outcomes a lot sooner. Ms. LeBlanc. So given that, um, what can, can you say or can you talk a little bit about the cost of, to the healthcare system for people who are, you know, in non-compliance of their drug protocols? And, that me, and I'm, I'm talking about financial costs, but I'm also talking about, you know, human cost, suffering. Ms. Bond here. So, so we don't have specific... Uh, costing data out. We, we know that the, as part of the national pharmacare debate, there's been some estimates uh, around those numbers, and I can provide you some of the pharmacare documentation if you if you haven't seen it. Um, but it but it is a significant cost, and it's one of the drivers uh, to why groups are looking to to the national pharmacare program is because our what we like to call catastrophic drug coverage. Um, the very definition of what catastrophic is is uh, very different across the country and, and how it's implemented is, is very different across the country. So while we in, in one province might say we think it's acceptable to have to spend 5% of your income to manage your condition, other provinces might say well it's accept we only think it's acceptable to spend 1 or 2%. Um, and, and so that, that's part of this debate is what should people uh, be expected to contribute to their health care, if any, and, and how do we ensure a, a level of equality of health care across the country. So that's the debate. It's not about whether we should have access to drugs for all people in the country. It's about how do you implement that in a fair way, recognizing that some provinces already have very strong systems. Uh, and are we going, as an example, Quebec has a pharmacare system. Um, they have over 5,000 DINs on their formulary compared to about 3,500 in this province. They have a very strong system. They have no interest in going backwards. So <laughs> are we going to bring our entire national system up to that level? Or what is it? Are we going to have an essentials medicines list? And again, this whole how we get to national pharmacare is the real crux. Because people recognize that there are it's not just the people who have no insurance coverage that we're talking about here. There's a whole group of people who have very limited insurance coverage or they have a coverage that they can't afford because that percentage, three, four, five percent, whatever it is, is too much for them because of their circumstances and so they start rationing and trying to make things last longer. So this debate on national pharmacare is huge uh, and one I think that needs we need to pay attention to as a province of where we stand on that, how we think it should be implemented? Do we scrap the entire provincial programs or do we and go with a national? Or do we fill in the gaps? Do we find a better way to provide catastrophic coverage? And, and that's a debate that's worth having into the future. Okay, Ms. LeBlanc, you have a few seconds. <laughs> um, thoughts on, do, does, does Pharmacy Association of Nova Scotia have a position on that? Order, time has lapsed for the NDP. We'll move to the Liberal Caucus. Ms. Di Costanzo for 20 minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and I am so um, excited and proud, truly, of our government for announcing that announcement yesterday. I've been waiting for it for at least a year and a half and hoping that I knew there was negotiation, negotiations, but what are these negotiations leading to, I wasn't sure. But when I saw four different items, I was truly excited. These are, um, it, it is um, a combination solution for so many things that our system needs to do. Everything is concentrated on the family doctor. And we can't, as you, as you said in your, um, uh, speech at the beginning that you know we have to expand the scopes of all our uh, health cares. Um, the, the, the pharmacists are well trained for so many different things that are not being used and this is a real example of what we're allowing the pharmacists who have been trained 
to do it. I, I, my daughter is a pharmacist and she says, mom, it breaks my heart. And the number of patients who I have to say no to because you know, I say to them, this has a cost and they leave the pharmacy and I know I can help them. And I don't know how long before they can get to see their doctor. It really is, a lot of the pharmacists I know, uh, they'll be so excited to be able to help those patients who are showing up at their door. So I'm, I'm more than um, excited for you and for our government for, for taking this amazing step. Um, but I just wanted to ask something about the, the access to birth control. To me, that was amazing. Maybe you can tell me in numbers, what would that mean? And how will that help um, the youth or the younger girls to come to a pharmacist? Would that be much easier for them than to go to their family doctor? Will, how do we track your um, access to giving the birth control within pharmacies compared to uh, doctors and how many, how do we track um, the number of visits to the doctor that we will be saving that, did you have, how do you plan to do that? Ms. Bonner. So as I, I did mention uh, earlier, we have built right into our agreement an evaluation of, of these new services so that we can do just that, is so that we can track who's using a pharmacy for these services, what does the profile look like, how does it compare uh, to physicians. Also looking at, and this is important um, as, a, as a government, and I think we need to, to think about this, is we, we are going to look at, are these patients double dipping? Right, so are they going, and I, that's just terminology, are they going to a pharmacist and then just waiting till they get that doctor's appointment and then going in and double checking with the, with the physician? So we have a bit of history. Um, we did a minor ailments project a, a few years ago, um, and maybe it was really early in, in sort of the awareness level, but we, we did, did find that uh, although the majority of patients did not do this, there was still a sizable group that within seven to 14 days uh, were visiting their family physician again. What we don't know is why. Okay, so that evaluation did not ask why they were there. They could have legitimately have been there for something completely different. Okay, so we don't know. That's the limitation of the research that we had at the time. But we are going to look at that because it's important that the messaging come from government that this is what we want patients to do. That this is not a substandard only go if you can't possibly get somewhere else because patients will heed that, right? They will they'll go, oh, okay, well then I'll just go if I have to. If we really want to change the system and we really want to move less uh, difficult, less complex things to other providers, then we need to encourage patients to do that. We need to promote these services from government to say this is the right thing for you to do. We did this because we want you to utilize this service because otherwise we do risk that in in creating a perception that this isn't as good as something else. And I think that's, a, that's a, something that we're concerned about and something we want to work with government on in terms of communication. Simple things, as an example, in New Brunswick, uh, in their emergency rooms, they have a sign up <laughs> in the, all their emergency rooms that says, are you here for a UTI? Don't wait for five hours, go to your pharmacy. Right? That type of communication from, from the system tells the patient that this is the right thing to do and we want you to do it. And I think we have to work collaboratively on communicating to patients that this is a shift in healthcare so that you all do have access to a family physician when you need the family physician and you have access to other providers all the time for everything else. And I, and I think that's a change in a messaging and something we need to work on collaboratively to, to spread that message. Ms. De Costanzo. Yes, thank you, and that's a really good point. And I didn't know that patients were double dipping, uh, uh, but I can see why, because they would think, you know, I'll just check to make sure that the pharmacist knows as much as the doctor, mm -hmm. right? Because we're just not used to it. Um, but just as with uh, vaccine, now people just go to a pharmacist. They, we've become accustomed. Why do we need to go wait an hour to meet your doctor to get your vaccine? It's much easier, much more. So I'm hoping that we will. And we as uh, MLAs, we can very, I'm excited to put a post and tell people so that they can go to their pharmacist and, and it's just makes sense. There is 1,300 pharmacists and th 300 pharmacies that are open at night. You can go anytime. The access point is going to be so much better for the public. So yeah. I can't see it but helping. Um, the 
other question that I really wanted to ask about is the impact of this agreement for the next five years, and how do you compare it to other uh, provinces? Where will it put Nova Scotia on the map in comparison to other provinces with this amount of spending that we've done? Uh, and, and uh, you know, are, are we one of, after five years, will we be one of the best uh, provinces in utilizing our pharmacist's uh, scope of practice? How do you see it? Sure. So uh, I think in terms of services, uh, this certainly moves us from one of the, the least funded uh, services uh, to one of the better. I wouldn't say the best. There's still there's still others uh, that fund more services, um, but it certainly moves us well up there uh, in terms of services. And, and to me, it's a very exciting uh, opportunity, even compared to Alberta, which some would argue has the, the broadest scope. Uh, that's a that's a two-tier system. So in order for pharmacists to be able to utilize that expanded scope, you have to you have to complete a sort of a certification. You become a uh, it's, a it's a different level of pharmacist. It's not more training. It's just a, an application process that you've worked in this disease state for a long time. You have other clinicians that can vouch for that, and but it's it's a different process. So I don't compare ourselves to Alberta very often, even though everybody will say to me, "Well, they've got all those green check marks," um, uh, and, and yes, they certainly do. But those green check marks relate to the those who are are prescribing pharmacists and, and not to those who haven't done that. So um, we have a very different model of, that's developed in Nova Scotia, and the, and I think the regulator here has done a really great job. It truly encourages collaboration with other providers as much as they might not like our faxes. Um, I, they will always tell you they'd rather the fax than nothing. It encourages communication. It encourages a, a collaborative approach to patient care. So I think this model, I think this agreement starts us down that path. Um, and and uh, hopefully uh, other provinces that are now behind us will, will, will take notice and will start to move down that road. I know my colleague was in, in New Brunswick, was in the media yesterday, uh, wishing that his government would uh, would take a similar approach than what we've done here. So I certainly think it, it leaps, leapfrogs us from where we were, and I think more importantly, it opens the door to fully integrating pharmacists into, into primary care, which you can't do overnight. And so I hope the next round of agreements takes us that next step into full integration. Ms. DiCostanzo. Sure, and I really, I just wanted to, I was very excited to hear about the UTI and the infections because we, we just had um, an incident with my father and he ended up, you know, with emergency and, and ambulance and we didn't even know, we just thought he had a stroke. We were so afraid and it turned out to be a UTI and the cost of this and he was waiting to see his doctor. And we, you know, we, nobody knew that this had progressed so much, but the cost to the system and to the family and everybody, and it had gotten so much worse. If, if, we, if he had the access at the pharmacy, I wonder how, you know, how different that would have been and where our numbers, uh, the savings, can you give us some idea on what are the savings just for UTI uh, infections that you're hoping to see in, per year? Ms. Bonner. So a, a couple of things, I just want to make sure we're very clear on the scope for UTIs. Uh, I don't want there to be any misconceptions. Scope for UTIs is uncomplicated urinary tract infections. By definition, that excludes males. Uh, so if it is a male, uh, it, it by definition is a complicated urinary tract infection and it in fact cannot be treated in pharmacy uh, at, at this time. Let's be clear, this is the first step into this and, and so things may change. Just like our scope in 2011 was much more restrictive uh, and very prescriptive, uh, changes have happened and I think in, in years time we may see changes here, but for now, that, that's where that is. But if we come back to uh, uncomplicated UTIs and the burden on the healthcare system. The thing about of UTIs is, is you, women know when they have them <laughs> and they know they need to have them treated quickly. And so by and large, they end up at an emergency room. And uh, we know uh, that it is the fifth most common, about 8%. I had a physician tell me yesterday that when he is on call in his community, 10% um, of the visits he gets on call are UTIs. Okay, so, so what we're talking about here is taking people out of emergency rooms and the cost of an emergency room visit 
uh, or into uh, you know uh, walk-in and after-hours care costs. So we're, we're talking reducing the fee from well over hundreds of dollars per visit <laughs> down to a, a pharmacist fee of $20 uh, for the visit. So the savings are huge. And when we know, given the volume of patients who are visiting ERs and the potential here, this is a huge cost savings uh, as well. Ms. De Costanzo. So, and then when it comes to the female UTI, um, I know to go to my doctor, they have a bathroom and they give you the bottle. How are you going to provide that at the pharmacy? Do, how is that being Ms. set up? Ms. Bodner. <laughs> to let Curtis give you the clinical flow of how this will happen in his pharmacy. Dr. Chafe. Yeah, um, even when you look at the health authority guidelines for diagnosing an uncomplicated urinary tract infection, um, catching the urine is not necessarily required because it can it can put in a false negative for just asymptomatic bacteria. It's like th we have bacteria in our urine. Our urine's not sterile, um, and so you can get a lot of false positives for that. So um, while that was something in the past, it's, uh, it's, it's, and that's, that's, it's, it's not something that you would look at right now. The other thing too, I know a lot of people, and, and I do have patients and they look for urinary dipsticks, right? And then that they fly, they, you, you pee in the, uh, in a little, in a little cup and you stick the, the stick in and, and depending on what color it is, it'll show bacteria or not, or, or certain things that are associated with bacteria. And again, they have a lot of false positives with them. In fact, interview and an assessment through the patient without any kind of sample taking is is what is the gold standard at this point and it's been run successfully in, in New Brunswick at pharmacies for the past three years so so when a patient will present to my pharmacy and you know through talking it seems oh yeah I think you might have a urinary tract infection come on into the room let's let's discuss this a little further um, in order to have a, a very good stance or, or to be confident that what they have is an uncomplicated urinary tract infection doesn't necessarily need uh, anybody to provide a sample anymore. It's, uh, the, it's, it's actually that, uh, that, that good. Ms. D. Costanzo. Thank you. I did not know that you can do that. That's, that's great. Um, and, but, um, I mean, the symptoms are there and very obvious, so I guess we will have... But there's no other diseases who have similar symptoms that we can confuse them with? I just... So. Anyway, uh, it's unusual that uh, we, we've been using this method for, for all you know, the last 30 years or 40 years that I know of, so uh, I'm surprised to see that, but lovely to, to understand that. And the other question I had here, it was the prescription renewal. To me, that is an amazing thing because there's so many of us are on medication for 10 years and for us to have to go to the doctor for every month or two months. So now if you're on a medication for a long time, every six months, then you need to see your, your doctor. Is that how it's going to be? If you can elaborate on that as well. Ms. Bonner. Sure. So the pharmacist has the uh, ability to renew for up to six months uh, and then so they can do that in shorter periods they could do a month then plus a month plus another but after six months they they will have to to have another uh, prescription so it's not it's not the um, we're not replacing uh, visits to, to family physicians. It's still important that people get to a physician on, on a periodic basis. What we're saying is, is they don't maybe have to go as often, and more particularly for those who can't get there, there is, there is another option for, for six months. Other provinces allow for up to 12 months. Um, we were at 90 days uh, until last February. Our standards were amended to 180 days last February. Maybe if this is very successful, we'll see a another change in, in, in a few years. Again, that's going to depend on on the uh, on how this is run and, and, and rolled out and, and the demand for, for longer periods of time. But again, that goes hand in hand with lab tests and, and being comfortable in writing a prescription for that length uh, of, of time requires you to have all of that information at hand. Ms. De Costanzo. I think I'm done with my questions. If my colleague would like to take mm -hmm. it. Mr. Jessel. Thank you, Madam Chair. How much time do we have, please? You have about four minutes. Four minutes, okay. We'll start off with a couple of quicker ones, I guess. Um, so to clarify, when we talk, we're talking, having the conversation about uh, communicating that, you know, the, the 
the first line of defense can be or should be um, entry into the far, in, into a to see a pharmacist, um, and you referenced a couple of different uh, things that people go into the emergency for, and they, you say you know you can just go down the road. Is that something that the triage nurse can communicate, or is there, uh, I guess, an issue that I'm not clear on that would prevent that triage nurse from uh, indicating that this is an option for that patient to the chair, please. Ms. Bonner. Sure. So I can speak specifically to the triage process in, in the ER, but certainly um, it could be built into that. I can speak to 811 for a second, um, because that's an area we think it's critically important uh, that pharmacies be added to the protocols uh, for these areas uh, when people are calling looking for an option. And, and with 811, it's a, it's a it's a process, <laughs> right? So these these protocols take time. It's a committee that develops them of physicians and nurses and pharmacists, and so that that's a process that we hope we can get started really soon. Um, that the government will help us move that forward because if you, again, if we want people to use them and you want them to feel that it's not a substandard care, th then it needs to be part of those processes where people are triaged and and then sent to the appropriate place. So certainly eight one one, we we are aware of how those protocols need to be changed. I'm not aware of how the triage protocol works in an ER, um, but certainly once we are aware of that, I would think for the same reason that we know how to do 811, we'd be able to, to change that process as well. Mr. Jessen. Thank you. Um, I guess further along those lines, uh, uh, communicating entry points to the healthcare system and people who have experience the healthcare system in such a fashion. Um, I, I think namely senior citizens who have, uh, who are in the habit of, of, I shouldn't say senior citizens, I should say anybody who's made a habit of uh, injecting themselves into the healthcare system, seeing like their GP as their first point of contract, contact, excuse me, um, do you perceive there, or do you anticipate any complications in trying to um, get patients to come in in a different way than they may have traditionally done so? Ms. Bodner. Yeah, but I, I think that particular group uh, it was is likely the most challenging group to change behavior, and I don't care if it's behavior in the healthcare system or otherwise. We get as we get older, we get more set in our ways. So. This system has worked this way for their entire lives, and now we want them to do something different. So again, that's going to have to come with direction from government, from physicians, from all of us, that this is the way it should be done. With, with the, obviously, with contraception uh, and with UTIs, um, you're looking at a very different population. A population that we know values services coming to them quick, efficient, um, you know, I don't want to spend any time waiting in an office or an ER, I just want it now, right? So that these services are going to be, I, I would think, very popular uh, to young women in particular for UTIs and for birth control, that they're going to be able to do this very quickly on their time when it's convenient for them. And I think we will see very little difficulty in communicating to that group of patients. I think, uh, again, with the older patients where maybe herpes zoster or um, renewals in some cases. Order. Um, Time has lapsed. We will move over to the PC caucus. Ms. Adams, 11 minutes. Thank you very much. Um, I was reading a study that we were sent in preparation for today. Or, um, report from PANS that states access to health care concerns are rising in Nova Scotia. A new study it said the advocates data has found that Nova Scotian concerns about access to health care in the province has increased 16 points since 2018. 86% expressed concern about being uh, unable to access health care and about a third said that they were extremely concerned and it went on to say that in a, a national study that found that Nova Scotians were more concerned than the naf national average by 8%. And I think that that's a really important statistic because you said to us that this was a, a first step. To me, it's a, it's a very small step. And what 
you said earlier was that there's been almost 10 years of cuts to pharmacy, and now we're getting 1.8 million to make up for the fact that you were underfunded for nearly 10 years. It's a similar thing that happened to long-term care. They cut funding two years straight. They've given a small amount of money based on the long-term care report. And then we also had cuts to other departments, and then they give a little bit of money back. So my question for you is 1.8 million per year is not a lot of money when you consider how many pharmacists we're talking about and how many potential patients there are going to a pharmacist. So do you have a number that you are allowed to bill for that visit and how much is it? Because I know that pharmacies were charging somewhere between 15 and $22 when the patient was paying out of pocket. How much are you going to be funded by the Department of Health and Wellness to do this? Ms. Bodner. Sure. Uh, so that it, it depends on which of the services we're referring to, so I, I can lay it out for each of them, that's no problem. So for herpes zoster and UTIs, uh, it'll be $20 uh, per assessment. For uh, contraception management, uh, there's a sort of a tiered approach to that. So you can, um, an initial assessment would be at $20. Uh, and then a subsequent assessment, depending on whether there was a change in therapy or no change in therapy, it would either be $20 or $12. And renewals, uh, again, uh, a similar tiered model. So if there's three or fewer prescriptions being renewed at one time, it's $12. And if there's four or more, uh, then it's $20. Uh, in terms of... Uh, caps and limitations. I just want to keep coming back to the number that um, the 1.8 million, there are no caps um, on billing. So if we use 1.8 million, we're not done. Um, where we, there are no, that's just an estimate of growth and it's, and it's not flat each year. It's a, we've estimated a growth, uh, upwards growth each year, but there are no caps. If we are successful and patients want this, then it will be a bigger investment, but into those, those four services. There are caps on the number of services we can provide to any given patient in these areas. As an example, uh, for herpes zoster, we can't do more than two in a year. For UTIs, we can't do more than two in a year. And, and some of the reason for that gets to the definition of what is an uncomplicated uh, issue versus a complicated issue. And if it's, it becomes complicated if they have more than two in a year. Uh, so again, it comes to the definitions of some of these services and best practices. Ms. Adams. So we understand that we have over 50,000 Nova Scotians without a family doctor. We now know that there are four facilities in the province, long-term care facilities, um, one in DeBert, one in Truro, who've lost their physician. And we have others in Riverview and Ocean View Manor and Eastern Passage. In the negotiations for this, were, did the Department of Health and Wellness come to you to talk about what role pharmacists have in long-term care, especially now that we're seeing an escalating number of long-term care facilities losing their family physicians? Ms. Bonner? Generally speaking, long-term care discussions don't happen as part of our uh, negotiations. They're typically negotiated directly with the, the providers of, of the contracts for those facilities. So it's not part of our uh, overall agreement. That being said, there are some discussions right now about uh, whether or not these services that we've just announced may be or become available in long-term care facilities because of some of the issues that you mentioned. So I think that's a discussion that's still happening uh, behind the scenes um, because typically our agreements do not allow for the services to be provided uh, in long-term care, uh, but they're having some discussions uh, around that right now. Okay, Ms. Adams. Thank you. One of the serious issues is that in the Truro facilities, if someone leaves the long-term care facility to go to the eMERGE, they're not going to be allowed back. So if someone leaves the facility out on a day pass with a family member and they go to your walk-in clinic or your, your pharmacy, are you going to be able to assess and prescribe their medications and have that translated back into care at the long-term care facility? Ms. Bonner. 
again, I, I'm not in a position to answer that today because the policies around this agreement have not been developed yet. So once they've made a decision about whether long-term care residents are eligible for these services, um, then that will dictate when and how we can bill and then get that information um, back in, into the, into the long-term care facility. Again, typically our services have been excluded from LTC care and residents of those facilities, regardless of where they obtain the service. Um, so so that, that is something that, again, we're trying to work through in this, because this is new, because this is province-wide, um, we, haven't, we haven't even seen uh, a first draft of policy yet. Ms. Adams. Okay, thank you. Um, I would hope that those policies are in place really soon, because those facilities are without physician coverage, and I can see um, what's going to happen if we continue to lose physicians there. I do have a question about if someone comes in and you decide you're going to prescribe a certain medication, but you're concerned and you need to call the family doctor. In the negotiations, if you call up the family doctor to discuss this with them, it's my understanding that the physician's not paid for that phone call. So I'm just wondering if with this new policy, is the physician going to be paid to be a consultant for you? Ms. Bonar. Uh, there's nothing in the pharmacy agreement that provides for funding for physicians. What physicians have in their agreement is, um, is a matter of negotiations. They've just concluded theirs. They have different funding models in, depending on the collaboration they have with other providers. Pharmacists aren't paid to take the physician's calls either. They're, neither party at this time is paid to have those calls. So pharmacies take... Uh, dozens of calls a day from physicians asking about which medications should be prescribed, what's short, what should they do. Again, neither party is uh, is funded to to take those calls. It's just something that's been done. But again, it's one of those things uh, in in the model. We have some underlying infrastructure problems in terms in promoting collaboration, and that the the way we are each funded to collaborate with each other and communicate with each other, it would be another one of those issues um, uh, on the list of things that need to be addressed. <laughs> Ms. Adams, thank you, and that's a really good point because if you already get a lot of calls every day from physicians, and if they're not funded to speak to you, and you're not funded to speak to them. I can anticipate because of the way phone calls go and when you're free to actually take a call that if an increasing number of patients are going to be coming to you that the number of calls potentially is going to go up. So if a physician is making a call then the patients in the room with them they can bill for it. But if the patient's not there and they're making the call to you, they're not going to be able to bill for it. So if it's a Thursday, the, the client was in to see you on Tuesday and you get a phone call, are you going to be able to bill for the phone call to consult with the physician? Ms. Bodner. No, again, we have no, no mechanism for getting funded to consult with, with other providers. And, and to, be, to be fair, we, we haven't, uh, in our modeling uh, in terms of this, we aren't looking anticipating increases uh, in communication in terms of asking questions because of these services. Again, this is fully within the scope of pharmacists. So if they have someone in front of them for renewals, um, they're going to, they have a patient file. They should have a full history. They have access to share for lab results. Um, you know, I would, I would think that they would have the bulk of the information. Yes, there'll be circumstances if the, the portal's missing labs and the patient insists that they had their labs done, they're going to reach out to, to the physician. But the whole point here is for pharmacists to exercise their professional judgment and to perform, uh, to perform that service. Ms. Adams, less than one minute. Thank you. Are you concerned about the inability to order tests or to read some tests that you may have incom incomplete information to make... Um, the safest prescription uh, recommendation. Ms. Bodner. Yeah, I think of, this is the issue that I've raised throughout is the, the uh, share being incomplete, number one, without, because we know that private, privately drawn uh, blood tests don't show up into share um, is an issue. Not being able to, to remedy that problem by ordering a, a test because we don't have the operational authority, it will drive uh, 
pharmacist to say that I'm not in a position to do this and uh, to to have to refer back to, to a physician or in cases where there is no physician, uh, you know, tied them over with enough medication with a short renewal and ask them to get into uh, another uh, facility. Order. Time has lapsed. We'll turn it over to the NDP caucus for 11 minutes. Ms. Chender. Well, I'm going to just jump right back in and let you answer that question. Um, but I'll just say the specific uh, piece of that that I'm interested in is where the barrier is. So, so you mentioned that you have the legal authority but not the operational authority. And on this check mark sheet that we have, um, it also says pending legislation, regulation, or policy. So in your view, what is it pending in this case? Is this an issue with the college? Is this an issue with the government? Um, what, what fixes this? Ms. Bodner. So yeah, I think it's, it, it is not a regulatory issue. We're not looking, we don't need a legislative, we don't need a regulatory, and we don't need a standards change. This is fully within the scope of the government and the health authority. Uh, to, to implement. There are procedures that need to be developed. We operate differently than a family physician. We operate more in a team environment. So there are th new things, but it's not new to Canada. Uh, Alberta's had lab ordering authority for 10 years. Um, so I, I think we can get there. I think one of the issues that's come up in the last couple of years is, is, is work uh, lowered work changes uh, within the authority. Obviously, with, with the amalgamation and now with OPOR happening in the authority first in the amalgamation of the three lab systems, that, that creates a whole different set of workloads and priorities. Um, and pharmacy just hasn't been in that sort of top priority of things to to do. So so we are hoping that in the, in the very near future we'll be able to to actually just start some small work in this area, have a few pharmacies connected to one of the three systems, start to work through those operational issues that we talked about. Uh, how do we do this in the best way? What needs to happen? How will the reporting happen? Work through some of those bumps and, and, and bruises and develop the policies we need and then hopefully expand and be part of that th amalgamating of those three systems province-wide so we can be part of that solution rather than an afterthought years down the road once this, the three are amalgamated and implemented and then we have to figure it out. This gender. And would there be a cost associated with um, operationalizing that lab testing piece for pharmacies? Ms. Bodner? As, in terms of a, a cost to to pharmacy, um, it, it would be there would be some training costs in, involved, learning the the rules of the labs, that that type of thing. Um, I don't think there's much in terms of other capital costs that are required. Uh, certainly, we have to look into building that into the the pricing model of services when we're. We're talking about labs, right? But that it's really early days in, in any of that. Right now, we're just trying to get it going. <laughs> Ms. Gender. Um, I wonder, uh, back to this issue around, um, just, so, just so that I, I know that I understand this appropriately. When you talk about the kind of cuts over the last decade, I heard you explain it as the fact that pharmacy funding is tied to drug costs. We have kind of successfully and rapidly and for the good of patients reduced those drug costs partly with the PCPA um, and so that reduced cost of generics equals reduced funding for pharmacies and so if I have that right then I guess my follow-up question is that seems like a weird system and um, that's not really a question that's a statement so I will add a question uh, which is is there a better system um, you know if we if we hope, which I think we ought to, that drug prices will continue to fall and be more accessible, you know, that's not, you know, you're going to be in a professional conflict hoping that. Is there a better way that pharmacies could be funded? Ms. Bodner. So yes, I, I do think there's a better way uh, in which pharmacy can be funded. And uh, it's certainly a piece of work that uh, my, my counterparts in, in Pharmacare, when we talked through this negotiation, we all agree, 
like lots of other parts of healthcare, that's a really antiquated system, and we should look for a, another solution, an alternative solution where we're paid for the services we provide, regardless of the price of an external product that we have absolutely zero control over. <laughs> uh, so we all agree with that. So then the question is, what is that better model? Uh, I can tell you that Quebec has been working on this particular issue, this file, for about th at least three years now. Uh, in trying to figure out what that solution is. And they continue to work with government and to define it. So they will hopefully be a leader in this area. They've certainly made some progress. Uh, they, haven't, they haven't landed on, uh, on anything, uh, but we are, we are committed to working before the next agreement to see if we can come up with a model that sort of removes that aspect of, of pharmacy away from something that we have absolutely no control over. So we set an agreement today based on what we know today and if it's like the past we'll have three different things happen to us over the course of our agreement that impact our funding uh, that came out of the blue to us um, but aren't in the contract so we have no control over so yeah we are hoping to to find a better model and I think we can get there I think there's there are options out there uh, we have other providers that aren't tied to a product <laughs> we should be able to remove pharmacists from that product uh, as well. Ms. Chender. Um, I just, I'm curious if there have been discussions uh, at the college or in, with you guys around um, the prescribing of birth control. So as you mentioned, I think in your opening, the, the hope would be that this would be reduce a barrier to access. I mean, I know myself as a teenager, that was not a conversation I wanted to have with my doctor. I suspect that will be the same for my daughters. Um, and so for all the reasons that you say pharmacies are a good place for these conversations, um, I agree with you. Uh, however, we know that today in Nova Scotia there are doctors who will not prescribe birth control. Um, and in small communities and, you know, particularly maybe some of the places where already there is an issue with accessing a physician, is there any assurance either um, in the way that pharmacists are trained or in the way that you kind of roll out, not the expanded scope, but the expanded access that will take place, um, that you're sort of actively working to mitigate against, um, you know, a young woman finding herself speaking to a pharmacist and then being denied access to a prescription. Ms. Bonner. So, so like with all healthcare providers, pharmacists also have the, the right to, to refuse based on ethical uh, and, and moral reasons. However, <laughs> uh, they also have an obligation to ensure that patient is cared for. So that's, that's first and I think it's important. The second piece is, as I already mentioned, we operate more in a team environment. And because we are a, 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 a facility that employs multiple providers, um, I would think it is highly unlikely, if not impossible, to be in a, in a pharmacy that all of the pharmacists would refuse on moral grounds uh, this issue. I think the other point, and I think a lot of people miss and don't, aren't aware of it, and I certainly wasn't aware of it three years ago when we started advocating to get this authority, um, birth control is over the counter in about half the world. Right? It's only in North America and Europe that we require a, a prescription. So I think we, we overthink this uh, way more than we, we need to, and I think the easier we make this, and I know that the, the Society of Gynecologi uh, Gynecologists in the, the US has recommended that this become open access. I mean, there is lots of, you know, lots of effort to move this, to make this simple and, and easy for people, and I think we'll, we will be able to do that. I think you know, those who will refuse on ethical A will be a very small number, uh, and B, the pharmacy owners are going to be aware of this, and they will structure their um, will structure their business accordingly to ensure that you know access is there. Ms. Chender. Thank you. I'm really glad to hear that. I mean, I always there's always still a fear for me because if you sort of operationalize what you just described and you think of a young woman walking into a pharmacy and then one provider saying, "Well, I can't do that for you." and if they're willing to stick around and if that provider is willing to share the burden with someone else, then they're sitting there waiting, maybe feeling shame because they asked and they were denied. So I know there's not, I'm sure there's probably nothing 
else you can say about it, but I would just flag that issue. <laughs> I'm sure it's not something you haven't thought of, um, but it's certainly something um, just that we'll be watching and, and seeing how that goes. Um, but to shift a little bit, you've been talking a fair amount of pharmacists' role in the community that, you know, this community practice and, and, and we've been doing a bit of research about how pharmacists might be better integrated into primary care generally. So the UK has some interesting examples of that. And I'm wondering what kinds of options there are for pharmacists to work in the public system right now. And is that mainly hospital-based practice or are there other ways in which pharmacists are integrated? Ms. Bonner. Sure. So, so yeah, we have a few hundred uh, pharmacists that work uh, in our hospital system here. Um, and, you know, in ways that I think many people don't even recognize. Uh, we have very, very skilled pharmacists that work on the floors directly uh, with patients uh, in, in hospitals in all of the de various departments. And uh, if, you, if you aren't aware of everything they do in a hospital, I do do recommend that you take a look. They're in the cancer wards, they're in the heart wards, they meet with patients pre-op and post-op on discharge. They are an integral part of the team in, in hospital and uh, there is certainly opportunity to expand that role in, in, in hospital as, as well as in community. So uh, certainly that's one option. The other option uh, where they are being uh, utilized a little bit um, is, Order. is <laughs> time has lapsed. We'll turn it over to the Liberal Caucus, Mr. Jessam. Thank you. And if you'd like to wrap up your your uh, answer there, feel free to go Ms. ahead. Responder. Sure. The other area is in some of the. Uh, uh, physicians' offices. There are some physicians that are uh, having pharmacists come in to do medication reviews. So we are funded to do uh, medication reviews. So they're looking for some opportunities where there's some funding to to bring them in. So they they do that a little bit. And I think for certain services that works really well. For other services, I think it works better to have them back in the community pharmacy for convenience sake. So I think again, that's there are there are a multitude of entry points, and I think we can utilize pharmacists in hospital better, I think we can utilize them in collaborative care centers better, and we absolutely can utilize the community pharmacy way better than we have been. Mr. Jessam. Thank you. Through the chair, I'd just like to ask a final question around, uh, I guess, supply management of drugs. I was made aware of a, a, an issue in the not too distant past um, around a shortage for a particular drug. and kind of uh, an awe moment that took place when they, when this particular individual went in and found out that they were going to be limited on, on how much of the prescription that they could fill. Um, so I guess like, when it comes to, we've got an opioid tracking system and it's kind of, as I understand it, overarching and we have the ability to know how much is coming and going. Uh, I'm just curious what the difference is between the general tracking supply management stream and how we do how we do opioids and like is is it i guess the the goal it would be to avoid this scenario whereby someone walked in found out that there was a a lacking supply of a particular medication um try to avoid that that scenario or that shock when you when you walk through the door Ms. Bodner it's a really big question <laughs> Uh, so I, I just want to, to distinguish between the, the systems. So the, the prescription monitoring program that we have is, is not really to deal with shortages per se. It's to ensure that um, patients are getting controlled substances in the manner that they are intended to be given so that they're not there's not double doctoring there's not early fills uh, so that gets monitored in the prescription monitoring program now that we have a dis so a provincial wide drug information system uh, pharmacies now have a view into all medications and where they've been prescribed uh, or where they've been dispensed so again there's a much more open view to to pharmacies whereas before the dis you only knew what the patient had if they had got it in your pharmacy, you didn't know what they had anywhere else except for those under the prescription monitoring program, you would get a notification. So that's, that's, a, that's a different issue. The supply issue 
is the drug shortage issue in supply is, is hugely complicated and, and something that pharmacy has been working on uh, for a while to be, make more transparent. So the drug shortage is database, the national database, has only been in effect for the last two two or three years that all the dates run together for me. But that was after a lot of advocacy so that pharmacy would get a heads up <laughs> so that we would have some um, and it, uh, some knowledge that shortages were, were coming. And it's still not great. Sometimes we get the notification on that day. Um, and, and that's a problem. The reason for the shortages is also a problem, right? Um, and, and, and that's where people who are in positions of making policy really need to understand how this happens. So as an example, if you reduce the prices so much of a drug that all manufacturers get out of the business of making that drug except for one, then you've just put yourself at risk for manufacturing problems at one facility. Um, and, and we've done that. So what we've done over the last nine years has reduced the number of manufacturers and reduced the number of facilities uh, where this is available. That is not the only cause, let's be clear. If there was an easy answer to drug shortages, I'm sure Health Canada would, would have made some progress in this area. Um, so you have single manufacturing facilities. You have where raw ingredients are coming from. So we've got raw ingredients coming from all over the world, from facilities all over the world with different standards. Um, and that's causing some issues that I'm sure you're all aware of in raw ingredients. So we know we've had some carcinogens in uh, blood pressure medications. Health Canada is now investigating that in some diabetes medications. That was just announced this week. So we, we have problems. So it, 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 it's complicated, but it's becoming a huge issue. As I said earlier, there are 2,000 shortages on the database already with five coming in every day. Pharmacists have been surveyed. They are trying to deal with this multiple times a day with no compensation. It's a problem. Um, and, and one that pharmacists can help a little bit with. Again, if we were funded to do therapeutic substitutions, broadly speaking, we would be able to find the best alternative drug uh, um, within certain criteria to help those patients more quickly. Because what happens now is that you're like, okay, there's another drug we could substitute, but there's no compensation. I can't go through this whole, because I have to go through an assessment and the documentation and all of that that I have to do for therapeutic substitution. So I'm going to have to refer you back to the doctor. They go back to the doctor. The doctor picks up the phone and says, what's the available medication? <laughs> right? So they don't like that situation any more than we like that situation. So that's, that's an area that, you know, we could help resolve a little bit. But the drug shortage problem is incredibly complicated. Um, and we want to, we're, our national advocacy body is begging Health Canada to, to work on this issue, to set it as a priority, and to think about it when they're doing, making decisions. Because when you play with pricing, it impacts on manufacturers' business decisions. Uh, and, and, and that is having an impact. We'll um, turn it over to Ms. Miller. Thank you so much for being here. It uh, certainly is a great time uh, to be involved with government when you see things moving forward like this that you know are going to have a positive impact on the health of Nova Scotians. And certainly because of doctor shortages, you know, I think we're looking for all different ways. And this is one way that certainly is going to have an impact as well, as well as helping your industry. So I talked uh, just before I came here actually to uh, someone that was representing one of the local pharmacies and medical clinics. And they're going to be working together to see which patients uh, who have lost doctors recently uh, will be able to be served uh, at the medical center, which ones will be able to be served at the pharmacy. So I think that you're going to see more of those collaborations uh, going on around the province. And, and it's a very positive note to see that it's become a, an issue that, uh, you know, we're all embracing and seeing how it can be best handled. So um, we talked a little bit about uh, how the patients you were afraid, you know, that some of them didn't treat pharmacists or with the same... Uh, level of, I don't want to say respect, but knowledge that the doctors had. And, and I think that you're absolutely on the mark, but, you know, for me, I know I would, uh, 
If we have an issue about a drug that maybe our, our doctor has prescribed, we'll talk to the pharmacist. And I have actually gone in to get refills filled, and the pharmacist says, no, 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 I can't. I have to talk to the doctor because this isn't going to work, or this counteracts with something, or this isn't going to work. And I'm hearing conversations between the doctor and the pharmacist debating over which are the best drugs to prescribe. And it certainly uh, gives me a real sense that uh, I'm being cared for that my family's being cared for, and certainly do appreciate that. I think it's wonderful that pharmacists are taking that role, and I was actually surprised to, see, to hear you say that pharmacists have the final say, that uh, if they're not agreeing with uh, what the doctor has prescribed, that they can actually refuse it if they think that there's gonna be a negative impact on, uh, uh, on the patient. So having that extra set of eyes there is certainly a fail safe and uh, certainly do appreciate that as well. Uh, there was a couple of things I was kind of thinking as we were going through all of this, and also... You have two minutes. Uh, <laughs> sorry? You have two minutes. <laughs> so also, um, 811, I know a lot of people call 811 uh, for medical uh, advice when issues are going. Do you expect that 811 during, you know, with the range of options that they have for patients will be able to also recommend their pharmacists? Ms. Bodner. So as, as I as mentioned er, earlier, uh, 811 is, is a critical piece of the communication uh, around this, and they have established protocols. So if you called 811 on January 1st, we're not going to be in that protocol. What we have to do and what we've started, the, the ball rolling, we've made initial contact uh, with 811, but it's going to require government uh, as well as the 811 provider as well as us to, to work together to get those protocols changed uh, as quickly as possible so that we are one of the options uh, when they work through their decision trees, uh, this is the nurses work through their decision trees, that we are one of the, uh, the options at, at the end of it. Ms. Miller. Thank you for that. And uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, can you tell me also, I know, you know, I recently had blood work done results go to my, my family physician. Can I actually request that so that next time if I need to have a refill and want to go just to the pharmacist and want to confirm with the, the, the lab results, can I actually request that information to be able to keep it myself and use it as a reference? Ms. Bonner. To, to get a, to an individual patient to get a copy of your blood work? So I, I think the process that exists today, if I'm not mistaken, and I know there's a bit of a hold on it, <laughs> is the uh, is the portal that your the, your physician and you can sign up for. Um, but you're, there's a change of providers that is happening, and so there are no new applications being accepted to that. But that I understand uh, as a patient. Order. That time is lapsed. <laughs> I'll ask for closing remarks from our witnesses today, um, or one of you, whichever, Ms. Bonner, do you, would you like to do that? Just very quickly, I really do appreciate the opportunity to, to speak to you today, to answer your questions. Uh, I, I think this is a fantastic first step, and I do applaud the government for that. I also think there's much more bigger, much bigger steps yet to come. Um, you know, we're here to help pharmacies live up to, to the trust that's been placed in us and to ensure that we can meet the expectations of patients uh, and to work collaboratively with providers. We work very closely with our partners at Doctors Nova Scotia, and we intend to keep doing so because it is the patient uh, at the center of this, and uh, we hope to be able to help to remove those access barriers in this province and really start to tackle the issues that this system in this province of aging population, chronic disease, that we can really help uh, shift the direction of this province and start to get a healthier uh, population. Well, thank you, Ms. Bonner and Dr. Chi for being here. Um, there were a couple references you made that you may wish to table some documents with our clerk here, Ms. Kavanaugh, um, before you leave. Um, we'll take a short recess to let our, our witnesses leave the chamber, and we'll have a short business meeting following that. And I'm sure the media will be uh, gathering with you <laughs> shortly. <laughs>
Order, we'll resume our uh, committee meeting and um, under committee meet, um, business. Our witnesses for January 14th, 2020, believe it or not, will be the next time we meet will be in the new year, um, is on children's oral health with witnesses from the College of Dental Hygienists and the Department of Health and Wellness. There are two approved witnesses from the Department of Health and Wellness, the Deputy Minister and Angela Purcell the Executive Director of the Pharmaceutical Services and Extended Health Benefits. The department is in the process of recruiting and hiring a new Deputy Minister and there may not be anyone in that role by January 14th. The Associate Deputy Minister is filling in. The department says that Angela Purcell is the most senior executive in the department who would be able to speak on behalf of, instead of the deputy, um, with specific knowledge on this topic. So the department has asked whether Angela Purcell can represent them without the deputy minister. She would bring along appropriate staff with her. If not, this meeting will have to be rescheduled for later in the year. Any discussion? Ms. Adams? Well, this was a topic suggested by the NDP, so I think it would be important for them Ms. to let us know. Ms. LeBlanc. We're fine with that substitution. You're fine with that? Okay, is everyone in agreement? Okay, so I will direct the clerk to um, make those arrangements or confirm them. Um, we also have a correspondence from the, uh, in your correspondence you should have a, a letter from the Veterans Affairs Committee regarding, um, has referred a potential agenda topic to the Health Committee. Um, Ms. Di Costanzo. Yes, at, uh, as the chair of the Standing Committee on Veterans Affairs, the, the committee uh, had passed a motion uh, at our November 19 meeting regarding the NDP topic using physician assistance to address health human resources shortages in primary care and emergency care. And we felt that this was more appropriate to have to, uh, at this committee, at the Health Committee, and uh, we would like to defer this to the Agenda Setting Committee. Okay. okay, is there any other discussion? Yeah. Uh, Ms. LeBlanc. Ma Madam Chair, can you clarify when that agenda setting is? Where are we in our agenda in terms of topics? I'll ask the clerk. Thank you. We should be ready for one in March. So, um, we feel like, given that this was a topic we brought, it was the one topic we brought to the Veterans Affairs Committee and it was sent over here to be added to the agenda, we feel like uh, it should be uh, simply approved by this committee and so that we can add it to the current agenda. Uh, it's a matter of great importance to the province uh, and it feels like there may be a little football being played with our, our topic. So if uh, I, would, I would make a motion that we actually just put it on the list now without sending it back to the agenda setting. Um, I think our, it's our schedule filled till then? Well, if we go through our current roster of topics, that will take us up to and including March, assuming Doctors Nova Scotia is available in March. I haven't spoken to them yet. Uh, and so the next available slot would be April anyway. Uh, but Ms. Adams, just. Thank you. There were a number of us who are here now who are at that meeting. And so we were all in agreement that it be referred to this committee. I think that a topic that's referred from another committee doesn't automatically make it onto the agenda. And since we reach the agenda setting time anyway, that it would simply go on the list of recommended agenda items from the NDP. Ms. LeBlanc. It's just that my concern is that if we wait until an agenda setting meeting, which would be in March, at the end of March, or the, I guess the meeting of March, then this topic could potentially not see um, a committee until, you know, sometime next fall. Well, there's no, there is, if you listen to what Ms. Adams just said, and it's happened at other committees, things that have been referred haven't necessarily um, been part of the agenda send it, setting, right. accept so it. I have a motion that we should not wait for the agenda setting and we should just add it to the list so that it, I guess it would be the April meeting, that we would make this topic the April meeting of the health committee. Okay, there's a motion on the floor. Ms. Adams, you want to speak to that motion? 
Thanks, so uh, just for my clarification, so does that mean when we do go to the agenda setting that you would forego uh, another topic for the agenda? Or are you asking for an extra agenda item? Ms. LeBlanc. Well, I guess I'm asking for an extra agenda item because this was our agenda item for the Veterans Affairs Committee and it was denied and told to come to this committee. So uh, I feel like it's, uh, we, you know, if you, uh, yeah, extra item, please. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Jessup. I'd just like to state for the record that um, there, was a, there was a movement to, to put this topic, top, excuse me, before the health committee but that, that, that did not dismiss an opportunity for the NDP to submit their a topic. We deferred uh, of, until a later date um, the ability for them to submit a topic in keeping with the practices of all of our committees. Um, can I clarify through the chair, uh, did Ms. is Ms. DiCostanzo have a motion on the floor prior to the... Uh, she didn't... Did you make it as a motion? Did she? Did she? I didn't. It wasn't. No. Um, I just like clarification, Ms. LeBlanc. Because something is referred to the committee, it does not automatically go on our schedule. So you're you're asking us to um, not have the subcommittee meeting and putting it on the agenda for April, and then having our subcommittee meeting in April. Oh. Right. Oh, just just agenda setting meeting. So, Ms. LeBlanc. Mm -hmm. That is what I was asking, Madam Chair. Um, I also don't know for sure if we have, uh, I, I, I guess this question is for the clerk, do we have uh, rules and regulations and way of working? And this, this committee is quite new, and so someone has, a member has just said, well, we don't do that, but I don't even know if that's written down anywhere. So it might be good to, um, to define the terms and references of how the committee works. It might, there might be somewhere that we, we know that. Anyway, that is my motion. I understand it's gonna get voted down, so I'm happy to go to question on it. Okay, we we have a motion on the floor. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Aye. Uh, motion is defeated. Um, Ms. De Costanza. Now I'd like to make the motion to defer this to the agenda setting meeting before the time runs out or we need to okay. extend the time. Any question? All those in favor of deferring this to the agenda setting meeting in March? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion is carried. Our next meeting will be Tuesday, January the 14th, 2020, from 1 o'clock to 3 p.m. The topic will be children's oral health. This meeting is adjourned.